Hear that? That's the sound of you creating your own destiny. While others are waiting in line for brunch, you're spending Saturday in the garage. Because you went to AdvanceAutoParts.com, ordered a platinum battery with a three-year replacement warranty, and picked it up in-store just 30 minutes later. Now, installing a battery isn't an all-day job, but what the brunch crowd doesn't know won't hurt it. Advance Auto Parts. Let's get you back on the road. Visit AdvanceAutoParts.com to learn more. The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. 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 All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I'm coming to you from the Broken Skull Challenge Compound out here in Agua Dulce, California. We are still filming the absolute baddest, toughest, coolest show on television, Steve Austin's Broken Skull Challenge. Hey, and that ain't no joke. Conditions out here have been hot, sunny, windy. It's been awesome. Hell, yesterday, it saw fit to rain in the morning, and then the wind was blowing like a bitch all day. And then it was about 60 degrees with the wind chill. It felt like about like 50 degrees. And my stupid ass is out there walking around in a pair of camouflage shorts and a T-shirt on. I'll tell you what, from a temperature standpoint, it don't seem that cold. But when you're out here blusting around this goddamn wind blowing 30 miles an hour, it should have knocked your ass off. And it feels like, shit, I think uh, I was driving over to do the podcast last night, and I was driving over to my buddy's house you're going to hear on this show. His name's Alan Bishop. He's a challenge creator for a lot of reality television shows and was working on Amazing Race, uh, Survivor, Broken Skull Challenge. He's got a very interesting background. We're going to hear about his background and what he does now. We're going to talk about some fitness things that I hope you take away from his podcast and employ in your life. But I was driving over to Alan's place last night. He rents a house out here while we're filming. And my face felt red as fuck. You ever get out there, your face gets wind chapped or wind burned, whatever you call it. I was like, God damn, I've been out here in the sun all this time. And all of a sudden the cold weather comes and it rocked my world. I think I'd rather be out there in the hot ass sun and a sand blaster more so than the cold weather. For some reason, after all the beatings that I put my body through, My body would rather deal with the hot weather, although personally, I don't really dig hot weather. I'm down with about 65, 70 that I usually wake up to in Marina Del Rey every morning. I just don't need a 30 mile per hour wind coming across the mountaintop and chapping my ass, or my cheeks in this case. Hey man, this has been a good ride. I've enjoyed this season of Broken Skull Challenge. There's been some tremendous successes. There's been some epic failures, a couple of disasters. Everything that you can imagine that goes with the filming of this show, live and in living color as it happens, has been absolutely premier. I want to give a shout-out to all the crew members who have been so awesome filming this show. We have four days of filming left. I'm recording this podcast right now, and I'm about to jump in my 88 Dodge Ram Charger with 27,900 miles, original miles, and do all the driving shots you see when I'm pulling up to the contestants and all that. We're going to film that. So once I get finished, uh, well, I'm done for the day. We just got finished. And uh, then it'll take me about four or five hours of driving time through different various areas and uh, do all the shit that they use the camera angles on. Use a director, use a jib camera, all the cameras strapped to the Dodge Ram Charger. It's going to be pretty damn cool. And it's really, it's kind of like I always tell the contestants out here. You watch this show on television, and it flies by in 60 minutes. As soon as it starts, damn near, it's over. That's how fun and fast the show moves. But when you're doing it, it's an all-day process. So, you know, four or five hours of driving, they'll edit that down, and boy, you know, shit. When you put that on television, there'll probably be, I don't know what, five, eight, ten seconds of the Ram going through its paces. But when you do it, you're just picking, but when you do it, you're just cherry-picking those cool hero badass shots that you employ with the different television angles and then ramp up the speed or slow it down. So got a talented group of people out here. Hey, man, before I go any further, I want to give a shout-out to the chairman of WWE, Vince McMahon. 
I heard he had a weightlifting accident uh, and had to go under the knife to get fixed up. Hey, Vince, please get well soon. I know you work your ass off and you work out so damn hard. Uh, that dude's like nothing I've ever seen before. I ain't never met a guy or any human being, guy, girl, whatever, like Vince McMahon. I always tell people he's one of the most unique people I ever met in my life. You talk about a go-getter with lots of drive, determination, and guts, that's Vince. So Vince, God dang it, sorry to see you go through a surgery. Hope everything heals up okay and you get back under that bar and start squatting again because I know that's exactly what you're going to do. But you like me right now, man. you got to go through the paces and healing up. I've been working on this right shoulder now for five months. Still inclined benching about 55 pounds. I've kind of modified my training, as you'll find out a little bit in this podcast, as Alan and I start talking about working out and commitment and, you know, sticking to uh, a diet and sticking to working out and just, you know, I think as Alan says, you know, honoring your word. So hopefully you take away some of the things from this podcast, but I got a chance to do some different techniques in my trailer here because the weather was bad yesterday morning and it was raining cats and dogs and I wouldn't go squat out in the cold so I modified a workout and I'm going to drop you the time my new time on the workout you'll hear the workout time that I did when I talked to Alan but I did that workout back to back I did it this morning when I got up and I beat that time by five minutes so I'll drop that new time on you in the close of the show but I've been switching things out, and i still got a long ways to go with this damn shoulder. i probably got at least three, maybe four months to go before I'm at full strength. It's been challenging out here. All these badass athletes come out here, and everybody looks like a million bucks, and everybody can perform because that's what the Broken Skull Challenge is all about. I mean, you know, performance talks, bullshit walks. But I'm not out trying to perform. I'm the host of the show, but as far as my performance – I'm still trying to build back my right pec, my right delt, my right lat, my right trap, my right arm. Includes the bicep and tricep and even my forearm. So when you walk around and, you know, one side's pretty jacked and the other side looks like shit. It sure plays into your head. But you can't rush the rehabilitation process. And Vince ain't going to be able to rush that rehabilitation process. You have to let all that surgery heal up. You have to let everything do, you know, its due course in time of healing and get back on your horse and keep riding. So that's what I'm doing. Speaking of riding horses, man, last Friday happened. I got to tell you guys this story. Last Friday came and went, and I had already pre-packed my Range Rover. I was getting ready to haul ass back down to Marina Del Rey because I live out here on a set, and then I go home on the weekends. So, man, I was already pre-packed. I was going to try to beat the traffic. Well, I wasn't going to beat it and just ride it in get off uh, at least get home earlier than i did the last time so man i'm all ready to go so i start throwing shit in my pocket i got me a water to go got my billfold got my pocket knife my cold steel pocket knife in my pocket and i'm thinking all right i'm ready to go i get my range rover i push the start button and nothing happens I'm like, well, what the fuck? So I start grabbing around on my belt loop because I always keep my car keys on a carabiner, whether it's my Dodge, whether it's my Ford Bronco. I always carry my keys on a carabiner, and I hook that hook on my belt loop. It's just automatic cruise control. So I'm like, feeling on my leg, ain't no keys there. What the fuck? So, and I go to the trailer. I've already turned all the lights off. I've already cleaned everything up. I've got everything organized. And now I've got to go through the paces and pick up all my T-shirts, all my shorts, just retrace everything. Last time I saw the keys was in this booth, little kitchen table that I'm sitting at right now doing open for this podcast. And I'll be goddamn if they wasn't on the table. Well, then again, they was over behind my coffee maker when I took them off over there. And so I checked over there and they wasn't there. Well, Maybe I'll put them in the top drawer right underneath the uh, oven range right there with my silverware. Nope, they weren't there. So I go back to my bedside table. All the drawers over there. All the drawers in the makeup mirror where I keep all my shit wasn't there. I damn near turned this trailer upside down and I said, you got to be shitting me. I went in my backpack, grabbed my backpack out of the SUV, brought it in here for some good light, started pilfering through there. Now, 
if the keys would have been in the backpack, then in theory, if you got one of those five key kind of gimmicks, if it's in the damn car, you're good to go and your motor will start. But I figured since maybe if it was in my backpack, the backpack was shielding the little rays or whatever uh, from the ignition and it couldn't recognize it. So I went through my backpack and I found more and more bullshit in there than I was hoping to find. But I also found another broken skull pocket knife that I've been looking for for quite some time. So there was a silver lining in the dark cloud, but there wasn't no car key. So I'm thinking, man, what the fuck? What are you going to do? You're out here 50 miles from Los Angeles and you ain't got a key to your car. So you can't go nowhere. And I said, I'll be goddamn if I'm going to spend a Friday night out this motherfucker. I'm going home to my wife and my dogs. So what do you got to do? You're a fucking badass, macho, tough guy. What are you going to do? So I called my wife and uh, put her on FaceTime, and she tried to look through the trailer with me to guide me where she last saw my keys when she came up the day before to drop off some food for me. Well, my illustrious wife couldn't find my keys either. So finally, I looked at her on FaceTime. I said, Kristen, I said, let me turn this motherfucker over again. I said, I'm going to hang up. I'll catch you later. I'll call you and tell you what happens. So I hung up for my wife, and I'm thinking, you stupid motherfucker. You probably going to have to call Uber up here to get your stupid ass back to Marina Del Rey. And I'm going to feel stupid as fuck rolling up in an Uber, riding with some person I don't even know, when I got a perfectly good automobile sitting by my trailer. I'm just too dumb to find the damn keys. And then I go home, get the spare key, get my wife or Uber to bring me back to work on Sunday evening, and then I can start going back and forth again. That ain't going to happen. So then I just said, you know what? Here's what I'll do. I'm going to retrace everything. Maybe, just maybe, they're in that last drawer down in the back of the camper. There's a drawer here in my camper that when we leave, I throw my Ram Charger keys and my Kawasaki Mule keys in this one drawer. It's got three magazines in there. They ain't my magazines. I hide the keys underneath the magazines. Now, when I was doing my cursory look, I just opened the some bitch up and scrambled through it and didn't see shit. And you know, all the times when you lose something, you keep checking the same place that you just checked because you think the some bitching thing that you lost is going to automatically show up where you just looked. Like just Houdini or David Copperville is going to say Shazam. Goddamn, I just looked on the kitchen table, walked away, and then I came back, and there they were. No, that don't never happen. So anyway, I went back to that last drawer. And I'll be a motherfucker, lo and behold, if there were my carabiner and the keys to my goddamn Range Rover. I'd done wasting an hour's time. I'd pre-packed my car. I was ready to haul ass, lickety-split, and get home. And I finally found my goddamn keys. And you know what? I felt like kicking myself in the ass, and if I could have adjusted my leg at a proper angle, I would have kicked my own ass. Because that's how stupid that shit was. In fact, I didn't go back there and look more thoroughly to begin with. There they were underneath that magazine. I put the carabiner on my belt loop. I shut off all the goddamn lights. I got in the Range Rover, put on my seat belt, pushed the ignition button, started that motherfucker, turned the air conditioner on high, rolled the windows down, and headed home to Mama and my baby dogs. And when I saw Mama and my baby dogs at the house, Tears were coming down their face. Tears were coming down my face. Everybody was happy. Jubilation. Celebration. I had found my motherfucking keys. That's bullshit. Wasn't nobody crying and shit like that. Hell, I had to carry all this shit in the house myself. My wife didn't even cook me no goddamn dinner. But I was glad to be home. I'm kidding. She did cook me a chicken pot pie. That's the end of that goddamn story. Hey, let's talk about... uh. What we got going on today, Alan Bishop, my friend out here at the Broken Skull Challenge, is my guest. You're going to hear a little bit about his background and hear about what he does, and we start talking about a little bit of fitness and some techniques to employ. So if you get anything out of his podcast, think about commitment, think about honoring your word, think about not setting a goal that's going to set you back too far, dig it. My conversation with Alan Bishop, but before we get to him, hey, football is back. 
We're rolling into week two. And if you're looking for a little action on some of the weekend games, and get yourself to BetDSI.com. Use my promo code AUSTIN25. That's Austin and the number 25 with no space and get $25 free when you register. And, hey, don't worry about playing with BetDSI. They're one of the original online sports books. Been around for over 20 years. They set a lot of the lines you're already playing on. And more importantly, they pay. They've built a solid reputation on payment of winnings. They take professional and novice action, and BetDSI.com is really quick and easy to use. You can play from your computer or from your phone or tablet. The site is so trusted that many professional players do their betting there. And right now, like I said, BetDSI.com is offering this beginning of the season special. Just use my promo code AUSTIN25 when you sign up and get $25 free just to try the service. Or take advantage of their 100% bonus on your first deposit. They'll match what you deposit. So go to BetDSI.com and use my promo code AUSTIN25. AUSTIN and the number 25. No space between. Take advantage of their two great offers and win yourself some money. BetDSI.com. Yo, Disco, the good thing about keeping it 100, we talk about all my favorite topics, pro wrestling, sports, politics, pop culture. Yeah, so why in the world do we need Kevin Gill on the show with us? Yo, KG, on Keeping It 100, we got unique segments like the Crazy Hooventude Guerrero. We got Shane Helms. We got the Lucha Libre Minute. Not to mention incredible interviews, but why do we have Disco Inferno? Hey, Kevin Gill, you know the Conan buried you behind your back. That's funny. He does the same thing to you. We never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Boom. Listen now at podcastone.com, the Podcast One app, or subscribe on iTunes. Keeping it 100 with Conan. Steve Austin, Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, man, I'm sitting here with Alan Bishop. He's one of the challenge guys. Alan, what's your position on the show? I'm the supervising challenge producer. What does that mean? Just work with the whole team to make sure that the challenges run smooth, that creatively everybody's on page, that all of the executives um, have their needs met, and we listen to what they have to say and work as a team to, to make it the best show possible, okay. but specifically around the challenges. But we've been working good for a couple of years on the Broken Skull Challenge, and we met back at the CMT building in Santa Monica a couple of years ago yeah. when we first came up with the show. I remember we was on location somewhere. And uh, my manager and me were talking. He's like, hey, man, this Redneck Island is cool, but you ought to have your own challenge show, you know, like uh, something badass. And we're like, yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, it's a challenge show. Hey, Broken Skull Challenge, sounds like a great concept. So we pitched it to CMT, and they liked it. So how did you end up in that room? Because here's what I don't want to do. I don't want to turn this into an interview to anybody that's listening to this podcast. Alan's a friend of mine. We're just going to talk about some of the shit that we talk about every single day at work. Well, we don't talk about how we met, but we're going to talk about fitness. Uh, Alan logging all of his workouts for five or six straight years and what he's found from that, the times when he stopped drinking alcohol, his days in the Army, uh, being a mountaineer, a guide, working on the Amazing Race, Survivor. You've done a bunch of cool things. But fun. anyway, take me back to how we met and what you thought in that room when we came up with the idea for the show and you bought into it and said, hey, I want to be a part of this. Yeah, I, the part of that, that I think struck me more than anything about that first meeting, and I apologize to all your listeners if uh, they think when I say about, they, uh, they think I'm saying a boot, but I am Canadian, so yeah, I am saying about, not a boot, just to make sure people are okay with that. Um, in the room, the, the biggest thing that struck me was one thing you said, and it was just, you know, at the end of the day, I just want to find the most badass son of a bitch in America, men and women. And, and it struck me the, the simplicity of that and being in, in challenges and, and also knowing, you know, what Vince wanted the show to be as well. Um, cause we had had some conversations when, when he had kind of called me and asked me to, to be part of it. Um, what struck me was how honest it was. And I, and I say this to this day when, when people ask me about it, they, I say it's as honest as it gets. It's, it's truly fine and a badass son of a bitch and they're badass because they work for it. And I think that was what resonated with me, especially coming from you and, and you're adamant on, it. I just, I want it to be honest. I don't want it to be any fluff. I want it to be straightforward. And as a challenge producer and doing challenges, you know, I started challenges, doing challenges before reality TV was even a thing. I was doing it with corporate groups, inventing challenges and games and adventures and stuff. And always for me, the more simple a challenge, the better it was. And, to, and you know, a lot of shows try to 
just make it way too complex and there's so many layers and and that can work on some shows but for physical performance and and for what we we all really thought would be great to get athletes and i was really into crossfit and crossfit was exploding it just seemed like a perfect opportunity to create something and be part of a team that was creating something that was no bullshit it was just you know and when we went with the rounds it was you know we want to pit people against each other in some strength then test their engines and then put it all together in, in just this badass final moment, which was the skull buster. And that, that was exciting. But who reached out to you and got you in a room? Because I know I was there with my manager and 51 Minds was at the production company. Who reached out to call you to be in that room? I think the, the way it actually happened, there was a, a woman by the name of Angela Shelley. And my first TV show ever was with her on a deserted island in Fiji. It was seven families competing for a dream, or a dream home on the island of Fiji. And I worked, she was the, I think she was a production coordinator or something at that point, an Australian woman, a really great lady. And she knew that I kind of lived and breathed challenges. And she was working in, in, I think maybe like some sort of a story role at, at 51 Minds, the production company. And they were looking for the line producer who did the pilot. Uh, read it they were saying you know who's who do you know for challenges and I think Angela put my name in the hat and I was on location in uh, the Dominican Republic working on this just the craziest challenge I've ever been on at, uh, uh, for TV Azteca a Mexican TV show and I get a call from Vince um, saying look we got this this thing I got your name so you knew Vince and you're talking about Vince Cariotti the showrunner yes so, yeah absolutely so yes. you knew him I hadn't known. I, I, oh, I hadn't met. I hadn't met Vince so at all. He's was, calling you on. He was calling me while I was in location, and and he told me a bit about it. Told me it was with you, and again that I think it was that uh, that honesty that really that really attracted me, and that it was going to be an athletic competition, which is something that you know one I I find very close to my heart, but two it was just going to be just an exciting new show, something somebody hadn't done it this way before. So then you're you're in a room, and then you, they say, "Hey, this is cool." So you you come up with challenges, but how in the world do you come up with challenges? Because you said you were doing that before you got into reality television. How did you get in the business of doing that, or were you doing it just for fun? No, I I, I think I, I was doing it for fun. I was I was kind of one of those. I had a real weird upbringing. I, I kind of left home at 15 and and traveled all over North America for the first three years. Then I was in the military, and when I got out of the military, I started guiding again, and. What what started happening was I do these guided trips and hiking, uh, kayaking and rock climbing, and do I'd do some seven day trips and some some longer trips, just for people who want to go on an adventure. Yeah, paid like a paid paid adventure for CEOs or um, or just anyone that wanted to sign up for a kind of a wilderness trek. And what started to happen was I started getting more kind of CEOs, more uh, business managers and things coming on my trips, and then in about nineteen ninety three ninety four. Um, I started getting calls from these managers a couple of years after I'd done, done these guided trips. And when I was guiding, you know, people tend to have a pretty shitty time when they're walking on their feet for the first time and their feet start hurting and they get blisters and their backpacks are heavy or they're, you know, they're, they're tired of, of paddling against a current. So you got to play games. You got to get their mind off that. You know, if their feet are sore, you got to get their mind off their sore feet so you can make it to that camp so you're not late in your schedule. So I started doing things like playing games, you know, just stupid little games. Like it's the, one of my favorite that I used to do. You'd have a group of, say, 12 people in a line hiking, and you just try to get them to count to 10 as a group. And the only rule is that's all they can say as a number. And you'd be amazed at how long it takes a group of adults to figure out how to count to 10 when you can't see each other. And you, if anyone says the same number, like if you and I started and we both said one at the same time, you'd have to go back down to zero. And it's almost impossible for people to get to 10 unless they start, they stop and they strategize or they, you know, they do some planning behind it. And these little mental games of building teams, I just started getting really good at them and I started to love them. So I started to research them and, and see who else was doing this. But at the same time, these CEOs were now calling me into their to say, hey, I can't go away for seven days on a, on a rock climbing trip. Can you come to my office? And you know that game you did um, about you know, uh, what did we do? What did you, or has anyone shared this experience? Could you come do that with my team? Cause I think it'd be a good team breaker or team builder. And this was in the early nineties when team building and corporate team building really was taking a next stage. You know, the, the outward bounds and the project adventures had been around since the late seventies, 
But now it was really starting to shift to this performance stuff rather than this touchy feely, let's go on an outdoor adventure and learn about ourselves. It was now starting to shift to, okay, how can we really be a team and, and be more productive and more, more, uh, more, how can we keep our best and brightest employees? You know, how can we have a workplace that works? And I fell into this whole team building thing in the early nineties and, and just, I thrived on it. I loved it. Okay. Uh, so then how did you get into the reality television business? I met, uh, there was a race called the eco challenge with Mark Burnett. So Mark Burnett started a, uh, an adventure race in the mid nineties, like 1994, 95. I think he did one in Utah and then one in Maine. But the first big global one was in British Columbia, where I'm from, in 1996. And I was working as a guide at this point, and I, I actually had, a, I had a, uh, a youth group that I was working with. And I thought, you know, this is a, this, I had this 13 to 19 year olds. I was helping 13 to 19 year olds kind of gain leadership, but in an outdoor environment. And I thought, wow, this is a great. I saw an article in Men's Fitness. I was uh, on the BC Ferries coming back from an event. I'm reading Men's Fitness, and I hear about this crazy adventure competition where, you know, they run 500 miles through the woods in teams of four, horseback riding, mountaineering, kayaking, trekking, all navigated, um, kind of like a golf course that's 500 miles in length, and you got to go from hole to hole by different methods. And I thought, what a great place for these kids to go, see some great athletes. So I phoned them up. I, I was able to get his number, and I said, hey, this is who I am. I have this group of kids. Um, they were doing service projects too. So they were, I said, it'd be a great, we'll be part of a service project. And, uh, he goes, oh yeah, fantastic. Um, talk to this person and you can bring your kids to volunteer. So we went over and it was just a, you know, it was for me, it was a, I was a kid in a candy store because all of a sudden here was a sport that I'd been begging to do for my whole life. Like I really fell in love with the sport. Um, and the next year in 1997, I formed a team and competed in uh, in Australia in the 1997 Eco Challenge, and then from there on I started racing. Uh, 96 from 96 to 2002, I raced all over the world in these different multi sports Eco Challenges, and then there was, you know, the Elf Authentic Adventure and the Ray Goa and the Southern Traverse in New Zealand, the Beast of the East with a really neat guy you might have met him, Don Mann, a seal from uh, I think he's involved with the Bullfrog guys now. Okay. Um, I think Don does that, but he had a big race called the Beast of the East. In, in, uh, no, no, what are these, what are these uh, competitions that you're entering? Because what are you all going like a 500 mile trek? Yeah. Was, you got to navigate it yourself. You got a compass, GPS. What's the story? It was all, it's all map and compass. And, and the races would be different. Sometimes they were, they were usually in the early days, they were uh, mixed gender. So you had to have at least one man or one woman on a four person team. Um, usually they were four person teams. Sometimes you could go as singles. Um, sometimes you could go as, as doubles. Tell you a funny story. I, this, uh, at the beast of the East in Virginia, there was a, a military, uh, I think it was a major, it was major Blaine Reeves. And at Blaine, if you're hearing this, man, I love you. I'll shout this out to you, but it's one of the best stories ever. We're on this race and the first, uh, he was racing as a single. So he was solo on this 380 mile race in Virginia. And then myself and my partner were, we were racing as a two person male team. And the first, the first, so, and Blaine, Blaine was racing as a solo. So he had basically, I don't know whether he got a contract with Playboy or whether he was just helping them out, whatever, but the Playboy uh, girls wanted to get a team to go in Eco Challenge the following year. So they needed to get experience on a race course. And Blaine took on this playmate named Daniel Folta, I think it was, to be his assistance crew. And the assistance crew in, in some of these races, you, you were totally non-assisted production would just put a box somewhere in the middle of the jungle and you would have to find it, you know, and, and resupply yourself. But on some races you could have uh, assistance crew that would meet you at very specific areas where you could go in and they'd have your new clothes laid out. They'd have your bike ready to go. They'd have fresh food for you, which was great. And it was a huge help. So this particular race, it was uh, assistance crew and this playboy playmate, Daniel Fulta was Blaine's crew. So we, the first stage of the race is uh, about an 11 hour paddle then we did this huge uh, climb, uh, ascend up a mountain, and then a rappel off the other side. And then we had to get on our bikes. And the only place people could park, all these assistance crews, was on this one sort of road that was a public road. And as the top teams are kind of getting in to start their transitions, somebody, I guess, complained, because we're in rural West Virginia, or, uh, Virginia, just regular Virginia. And I guess somebody complained, so the police came and were like, we got to move all these vehicles and da-da-da. Well, 
we got there at the same time as Blaine and Danielle panicked. And I guess when the police told her to move, she got in the truck and she backed over all Blaine's crap, like backed over his bike. So now he's got no bike. So here he is competing as a solo. He's got his bike run over and this playmate who's just does no idea what to do. So Blaine, you know, borrows a bike and uh, from another team that had dropped out and off he goes. We see him at the, for lack of a, uh, just not planned, but we met him at the next transition. So we've been going, I think, probably another, we raced 81 hours that race and we slept for one hour in the 81. Um, and it was 380 miles. I think we were probably at about mile 200 or something when we saw Blaine again. And we pulled into a transition area where our food is all cooked and all ready. And he's right next to us, except Danielle's now not there when he showed up. She's trying to get his bike fixed and he has just all of his gear in her car. So now he's sitting there. He had to race the next part of the race in his bike shorts and boring food from everybody. This poor guy, he was drinking IVs straight out of the medic tent because that was the only water he had. Poor guy. He, he finished the race. He did it. He did an amazing job. And I think he ended up training the Playboy team. But I got to tell you, man, it was, a, it was the worst experience for anyone I've ever seen. Hey, I got to take a minute here and say thank you to sponsors and let me do this for you free every week. And that includes Dollar Shave Club. And man, Dollar Shave Club just keeps getting better and better. First, it was their amazing razors. Great quality at a fraction of the price you would pay at the retail store. Now, four years and three million members later, they're stepping up their game. They're on a mission to help you look, smell, and feel your best. They spent millions developing their own original grooming products for your face, hair, and body. They got you covered with pre- and post-shave formulas, skin protection formulas, hairstyling products, and some pretty cool soap and body wash products. You know the best part about it? They ship it right to your front door, along with the great razor, so you don't ever have to go to the store again. And here's more incentive for you to join the club. New members can get their first month free. Just go to dollarshaveclub.com slash unleash. But like I was saying, Dollar Shave Club makes it easy and affordable to get razors and all your grooming products. It's high-quality stuff at a price that won't break your bank. So give it a try. You'll see the products work and the service is world-class. And there's no commitment and no hidden fees. You can cancel whenever you want. Just pay shipping, and after that, it's just a few bucks. So get your first month free at dollarshaveclub.com slash unleashed. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash unleashed. And reading a little bit about you and getting on your website, the365effect.com, you said uh, you're into mountaineering and you guide. Okay, yeah, I, and you've done kayak stuff and all the stuff that you just mentioned. But how did you find your way about in the woods? Did you start tracking stuff, hunting stuff as a kid? Because some of the stuff that you're talking about ain't no joke. And then when you're taking people out on a mission, you know, how do you know where the hell you're at? Yeah, for me, I, I, my grandfather, my grandfather was a farmer and grew up on a piece of land. And that was the one place as a, as a kid. Um, I used to love going up there. So I'd hunt, I'd fish. Um, just I'd spend a lot of time in the woods and it was a big piece of land. So, you know, I'd go out and get lost for a weekend up there. And, uh, you know, I was interested in scouting and all that stuff. I never was a traditional scout. I think I was a beaver scout for a little while. Um, but for the most part, I just got interested in survival and wilderness survival and trekking at a very young age. So probably seven to 14, I, I did a lot of that stuff. And and then once you get interested in that, you know, the military taught me a lot about, about navigation and and um, I ate it up. I, I mean, my military career was more, I kept getting offered promotions or a training course. And for me, I always wanted the training course because uh, I don't know if you've, you've talked to a lot of guys in the military, when you're not training, you're bored out of your mind. Right. And you just sit, hurry up and wait. So if I had a choice, it was always going to be to do some sort of training. And, you know, I, I just I just love being out there doing active stuff. Um, for the races, it was, you know, in, in adventure racing, it was pretty cool and we don't have it anymore you know you've got the spartans and the obstacles and the muds and all that which i think is is allowing a lot of people to get out and do these events which i love but i do miss the the truly expeditionary you know when we'd get it we'd get a on most of the races back in the late 90s you would get free for eco challenge for exact existence or example the day before the night before the race started you knew the race was going to be whatever say 350 miles 500 miles you knew the length, but you didn't know the elements that you were going to be. Uh, you knew you might have to horseback ride, kayak, but you didn't know where, what leg of the race. So the night before, 
they'd hold a racer's briefing and they'd say, all right, here's the race course. And they'd show you the entire race course and they'd say, say it had 40 checkpoints. They'd say, you know, from checkpoint one to five, you got a mountain bike. From checkpoint five to seven, you've got to ascend a mountain and get over the other side. And they would give you all these checkpoints. So here's the here's where this checkpoint is. It's this eight figure grid, grid reference. You'd have to plan. You'd now have whatever time you wanted from when you left the race briefing to when the gun goes off the next day to plan your route, or else you'd be doing it as you're out in the field. But that was to me, you know, very rarely in this in this world do we get to be on an adventure like that. I remember in Brazil on a race, you know, we really have, when you, when you get a race like that, you can choose, do I go downriver 20 miles and then cut across the woods to get to that checkpoint? Do I go across the lake and up over the mountain or do I skirt the lake? It's entirely up to you to choose the best route. And sometimes your routes suck. And, you know, you didn't realize that, you know, there was a huge bog on the other side that wasn't on the map. So now you've got Instead of what you thought was going to be a 30 minute long trek across a thing, you've got four hours because there's no way you can get across this bog other than on your belly and knees. And you got to embrace that suck because it's going to hurt. Other times you make a really good decision. You know, once we decided to, there was this braided river section on a, on a, on a race course and it looked like you would be hours in this river. And we thought, well, why don't we just take the, the main river down and then we'll portage across this one spot. And it was the best decision. We gained about six hours on, on all the teams because the river was running at, you know, 18 miles an hour or whatever it was where we would have taken this huge. But that was a great decision. There's not many places that you can just go play on a global scale like that. But how did you get into uh, all of that? Because I know you grew up, your grandfather helped you out in the woods. Yeah. But then at 15, you leave the house at the road. Yeah. You wrote in your blog on the 365effect.com on your website and on Twitter, the 365 Effect. You're one of the healthiest people I know. You're very regimented, very detailed. You chronicled and journaled six years of your workouts, every single workout. But you took a wayward turn because what kind of background led you to all the hard living that you started doing at a young age that you would kick out of and now be as healthy as you are? Yeah, I just think I all I really – I made some – I think I think it boils down to I made a choice at 15 um, – I have my dad was an alcoholic. He was in an abusive relationship with with my stepmom, and my 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 mom and my dad, uh, my biological mom and dad, they separated when when I was ten. They got divorced when I was ten, and I kind of went back and forth with my mom and dad, kind of bouncing as a lot of kids do between the households. And I tended to gravitate to my dad at the end because it was easy. There was no boundaries. There was no parenting. Um, there was there was literally nothing, and. At 15, I, I really kind of got myself put into a situation where I'd been partying lots. I was doing lots of drugs. Um, you smoking cigarettes, too. Smoking right? cigarettes, yeah. I was, I you think had a lot of bad habits. My, my average Friday night was probably two packs of cigarettes. At 15, my average Friday night was probably two packs of cigarettes, a bottle of whiskey, and whatever kind of drug we were Man. doing as a, as a thing on that day. And that's 15. And I was like from probably 13 to, 13 to 17, 18. That was, that was my world. Um, so at 15, I just, you know, I got into a situation with my, with my stepmom and it was just like, you're going to make, a, you're either going to do this or you're going to do that. What's your choice? And, and when I look back at it now, there was probably three of those choices during that 15 to 15 to 18 year old time span where I think three choices were, thank God I made the right one. And I didn't go down that, that path. And, and I, I kind of think that whether you believe in people watching over for you or someone straightening you out, um, I definitely believe that I got pushed to making the right choice, um, but I didn't make some. I didn't make great ones all the time. I mean, I, I definitely found out who I was on, and I didn't know it yet, but I definitely found out who I was, and that kind of leads me. I found out I was an experiential learner, and and that was critical for me um, when I was about 22, 23, when I really started to figure out what I wanted to do in the world. Like after I got out of the military, the military was just the military. But did you get in the military because you needed structure? Yeah, I think I, when I, I ended up coming back, I ended up coming back to on this bit of pilgrimage I did. I went all the way from uh, Victoria, British Columbia, all the way east to Toronto, then down into the States. And I ended up back at Laguna Beach, California. Actually, my aunt was living in Laguna Beach. And then I went back up to Victoria. I kind of come to the end of my run and I was working as a or as a apprentice chef in a restaurant, and I'm loving it. Just you know, getting really good apprentice. And I, 
used to get off the bus and I'd walk by the army recruiting office. And one day I just, I just said, that's it. And I walked in. Um, I said, I want to, I said, I want to join the army. They said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to roll around the mud and shoot guns. Um, they said, sounds like infantry. I said, perfect. And, you know, four days later, I'm on the other side of the country with my hair cut off. And it just, it just was one of those things where I think it was meant to be. And, and it was really good for me. And it, it, I remember the first week in the military, I don't know if I told you this before. Um, we, there was a guy, uh, and I hope Jeff, if you hear it, that's a good memory for me too. Uh, his name was Jeff Anger. And with a name like Anger in the military, and he was a big dude. He, he reminded us, and he actually, we, Private Pyle from Full Metal Jacket, the Stanley Kubrick film. He was like Private Pyle. He couldn't do anything right. He was a, he was a sorry son of a bitch, but he was angry. Like Pyle was stupid. Jeff was just an angry guy at that point in time. And, and here I was being, you know, I was a scrapper when I was a kid. I'd been on my own, like, I mean, making my own decisions. There was nobody telling me what to do. And here I am first week in a basic training barracks. And they're telling me my shoes got to be lined up like this. And my underwear's got to be folded nine by four. And my shirt's got to be this thick. And every night they come and they kick my locker in and everything's got to be redone. That first week I was in a world of hurt. And one night, like probably the Friday night, I'm, I'm in the shower. And, you know, we're, you're, you're cleaning your rifle in the shower because that's the best place to do it when we were there. And uh, Jeff just starts beaking off and he's not getting stuff right. And he had screwed up on the day. So we all had more work to do. And him and I got into it. And I just, again, it's one of those, I think I had a good decision where I was going to, I was going to smash his head into the, into the, into the shower stall. And I thought, nope, just leave. That's not, you know, that's not going to be good. And I walked out and I put my hand through a pillar. I punched a pillar in the barracks and my hand went straight through it. It's about two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. And now I'm going, oh shit, you know, I'm screwed. I'm getting kicked out of the army. Like I, I should have hit the guy in the head. I wouldn't have left as much damage. And so I go, I go to the, there's a, there's usually like a, a duty sergeant on and I go knock on the duty sergeant's door and, you know, they're like, what the hell are you doing? You know, I wake them up and I said, well, I just got to let you know, I put my hole through the thing, my hand through the barracks. And he goes, I got to tell master corporal Oaks, who was kind of our platoon sergeant. And so I call Master Corporal Oaks and I go, Master Corporal, it's Private Bishop. Just got to let you know, I put my hand through the wall. And he goes, are you hurt? And I go, no. He goes, is anyone else hurt? I go, no. He goes, don't ever fucking call me here again. <laughs> and he hangs up. And then the next morning for the next two weeks, you know, it was 10 weeks basic training, like basic, basic, not even infantry training, but 10 weeks basic. I mean, he rode me for the next three weeks trying to break me. But that was a big, that was a, a huge, huge turning point for me. Because it taught me two things. It, it taught me, one, I could have that self-control I needed in the moment. And two, it taught me that sometimes it's okay to conform because there's a, there's a bigger message behind what, what's going on. Um, and it made me a better soldier because that, that, from that moment on, there was, there was for, through everything in my military career, there was kind of four or five of us, probably four, three or four of us, who were always at the head of the class. Like we would trade, trade uh, you know, best of over the course of it. But nobody ever broke. And we knew we could do anything. We knew that they'd never be able to push us past a point we couldn't get to. Um, so it was a good lesson at 19 years old. Okay, well, let's uh, let's jump to when you decided that you were going to pursue uh, what now is your passion, just working out. And you kind of gravitated. I would say you're kind of, you, you like, you do everything, but you're kind of a CrossFit guy. Yeah, definitely. That was a, that was a big inspiration. Yeah, but in conventional training, which you've done plenty of, let's say bodybuilding training or powerlifting, eh, it just didn't really float your boat. You did it, didn't really care for it. But what got you interested in fitness to begin with? Because you want to help this guy. I know now, but coming from all the partying as a kid, the bad decisions, going through the Army, did you come out on the other side and say, okay, again, going back to your journal of yeah. logging all your workouts, you never miss your wad, your workout of the day. So what took you to fitness? I think the main thing that took me to fitness back, I always, and I think I said this to you today, where my fitness is now, is I always wanted to be in a place where no one could tell me I couldn't do something. And maybe that was prideful back in the day, but um, in order to be able to do something, you have to be prepared. You know, if I wanted to step in, into a boxing ring, I had to be prepared to not get punched in the face, you know, as much as the next guy. So I had to learn that. If I wanted to not quit on a forced march, you know, I had to, I had to get my feet and my body in tune to be able to do that. You know, back when, even back when I was, you know, 16 years old, be thumbing my way out of Toronto, 
try to, trying to get to the next place so I could get some job to get food in my belly. I knew I had to walk and I knew I had to go through the cold to get to the next place. So it's like, you got to do it. Like you can't quit. You got to get through this. So I think I was always of the mindset that I wanted to, I wanted to be able to push myself. And in order to do that, you had to be prepared. When I, when I quit all the drugs and all that stuff, that was easy for me. It was, it was, um, you know, that was a lifestyle I was in. It was a crowd I was running with and I got a really addictive personality as well. And I think that's why I can do it, but thank God I can, you know, I can snap it off. Um, and I think fitness left that addiction in me. And I don't even say it's an addiction. It's, it's a way of life for me. It's something that I really believe in because I, I understand what it does for me. And, you know, why I journaled and why, why I, I mean, my thing now is I really want to, one of my goals is helping people to uncover their better. I think anyone out there is going to sell you a product, sell you a way of fitness. I think they're going to sell you, you know, a new car, a new house, a new set of clothes. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way the world works. It's commerce. Everyone's trying to trying to give you what they think you need. But unless you really know what you need, you're kind of just out there in the ether. You're just letting everybody impact you in their way rather than you impacting the world in your way. And what I what I did when I when I categorized and I I, I looked at myself over over those five years was I really understood, you know, if I if I eat this way, whether it be, you know, weigh and measure. You know, I'm just going to weigh, I'm going to do the zone, I'm going to measure my blocks, I'm going to weigh and measure every single day for a year. And that year I'm going to drink alcohol, and that year I'm going to uh, do, all, do all my wads, as opposed to the next year where I ate all paleo. And I didn't drink any alcohol. And I got between five and seven hours of sleep at night, and I categorized all my, all my workouts. So the following year when I didn't drink again, but I ate whatever I wanted to, um, and I didn't care about my sleep, what I was able to find out in those in those years of doing that was, man, I know what's right for me. I know what few like I, I talked to you the other day about this. Food is fuel. When I want to compete or I want to perform, I know what I put in my body is going to get me where I need to go because I've tracked it. I know what's right for me. There's no if ands or buts. I know what's right for me. And when I think about what fitness means or what living your life the way you're to your most, everyone talks about this potential, right? I think until you truly track what's right for you and try a whole bunch of different things, you're not going to know what your potential is because you really haven't tried everything. Um, and that was a real big, big thing for me to really understand that you got to be willing to take some risks. You got to be willing to fail. You got to be willing to not have that perfect body or, you know, or get a little fat in the middle because you want to work on your strength. Like you got to figure you also out. have to have the discipline to That's log it. all this and, and carry it out. I mean, it's one thing to talk about it. You detailed it. Yeah. Uh, you, you journaled it in detail, and you exercised it. So, you know, you made a plan, and you stuck to it, and you looked at all your results. So let's go back to uh, the year when you would uh, eat paleo versus just grabbing a handful of stuff, and you would drink or not drink. What was the difference? Did alcohol, because at this point in your life, you're maybe drinking, what, a bottle of, wi a bottle of wine or something, maybe with your wife? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, so, I, I mean, we're not talking about heavy drinking. We're just talking about consumption of alcohol. Yeah. So what was the difference in how you felt? Night and day. Like, I, to be, you know, I can go out. I think anybody can go out and have a couple of drinks and get out there the next day and work out. But if you want to look at your performance, for me, and again, this is for me. Yep. I don't You know, you're any, somebody else might be different. I don't know. But for me... I know without a shadow of a doubt, if alcohol is in my life, I'm not performing as good as I can. And I can go back. I can look at, you know, there's a lot of CrossFitters out there that might be listening to this or people that do, you know, 400 meter sprints or because I, I do 400 meter sprint workouts every once in a while. But I could I can look at over, you know, five years, I can say I did. Let's just let's just say a simple one that everybody knows, like Fran. Um, I can look at my Fran times when I was eating paleo. Um, and, not, and not just paleo, eating paleo and also eating more of a, um, just a, a low carb, um, protein and almost, almost a, um, almost a vegan diet on one level, but just a little bit of protein in there. I can know that my friend times are always better. They're always better. I, for whatever reason, I perform better in that level. I know when I sprint, if I don't, if I got alcohol in my body, I'm not as good of a sprinter. And you know, that can be, I think even one year, the fourth year, you know, I would go a month of alcohol and then no alcohol, then a month of alcohol, no alcohol. 
And I could tell even in even in those month, months, I you know Diane was a fifteen or twenty one fifteen nine deadlift hand staff push ups. It's noticeable. And the only change, you know, I know what I was eating, I know what sleep I was getting, I know what supplements I was taking. Um, the alcohol is the only factor. So I believe it because that's me. I uncovered my better. I know what it is. Um, and yeah, I love having a glass of wine. <laughs> I'm a big fan of red wine. I, I enjoy it. But if I want to perform, it's just it can't be part of my cycle. Okay. Uh... But I think, Steve, too, we've talked about this as well. I'm 47. You know, my, my goal in life, you know, isn't to be a world-class athlete anymore. It's, it's to be strong. It's up in my gym. It's to be strong. And so I added smart this year. My gym was always, always be strong to be useful. This year I added smart. Because at the end of the day, I just want to be small, strong and smart enough to do whatever I want. I don't ever want my body to say, nah, Alan, you better, you better not do that. So my discipline is to say, I want to be able to, you know, when I have grandchildren or when my sons, I got a 24-year-old and a 21-year-old, when they say, hey, dad, let's, uh, I'm going to challenge you to a workout today. Yeah, I want to bring it and I want to kick their ass. Um, but I'm going to be smart about it. Hey, man, let me take a minute here to thank another sponsor of this podcast, Diamond Dallas Page and DDP Yoga. Y'all know that DDP Yoga has changed thousands of lives, including the lives of some of your favorite pro wrestlers, old Jake the Snake, old Scott Hall, the one and only Mick Foley, AJ Styles, world champion, and Y2J, Chris Jericho. And now DDP has taken his life-changing program to a whole nother level with the DDP Yoga Now app which you can get for both iOS and Android devices. And that means you can do DDP yoga anytime, anywhere. So now there's no excuse not to get on the DDP yoga program. And the app has a lot more than just the workouts on it. By connecting to a Bluetooth heart rate monitor, you can track your calories and heart rate in real time. You can track your pain, measurements, and progress photos too. It's all for free in the app. Like I said, you've also got tons of workouts to choose from. The original DDP Yoga workouts, the new 2.0 workouts, and weekly live workouts from the DDP Yoga Performance Center. And to make it even easier than he's already made it, for a limited time, you can get the DDP Yoga DVDs for 20% off, plus three months of full access to the DDP Yoga Now app. Just go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. That's ddpyoga.com slash Austin and take advantage of this great deal. Commit now. Change your life now. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin to get started. Man, I'm caught in the uh, same way I've been training for years. I've basically never stopped. You know, just basically bodybuilding training. I powered up to it every here and there. But it's just bodybuilding training, you know, body part a week. Uh, but you did that for a little bit, and you got into the CrossFit stuff. So what is the thought process? Like a lot of these guys go out there, or girls, people, go into a box, a CrossFit gym, or anywhere, and start taking these courses or these wads, the workouts of the day. Yeah, yeah I don't know who's making them up. If it's the people at CrossFit, I know they do a bunch of this stuff and they, they put them online for free. It's a, it's a huge deal, big money maker, good for them. But when you go to create your wads, your workouts of the day, where are you getting them from? Are you just making them up from scratch? Because I was in my trailer today. We're out here filming the Broken Skull Challenge, and Alan can vouch for me when I say this. It's been hotter than hell out here this year. <laughs> And the wind's been blowing, and it feels like you're in a sandblaster. My face is so red right now. We woke up this morning. It was a slight rain. It was about about 60 degrees, but the wind was blowing, so it felt like 50. I'm out there in a pair of shorts and a, a T-shirt, and I'm freezing my <laughs> ass off. So today was squat day, and I went out to my power rack, <laughs> and I said, man, I ain't going to sit here and squat in the rain. So I grabbed my 30-pound dumbbells, took them in my trailer, I got my uh, salt air bike, and so I looked at Murph. And, you know, Murph starts out, we were talking about the other day. It yeah. starts off with a, a mile run. One mile run. Go ahead. Yeah, it's one mile run, 100 push-up. One mile run followed by 100 push-ups, 200 pull-ups, 300 air squats, and then another mile run. Okay, so I did, couldn't run a mile because uh, I didn't want to run in the rain. There's a track right outside my trailer. My homie don't run in, in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Not as beat up as I am. So I was going to just make it a two-mile ride on my assault air bike. And then I was going to jump down and do the 100 push-ups. I did two push-ups, <laughs> and I was like, man, my rotator cuff ain't ready for this. Smart move. So I just switched, I switched them out for 100 hammer curls with 30 pounds. Then uh, used 200 crunches on the 300 air squats. I crapped out at 150. <laughs> 
Alan, I was I was squatting uh, above 450 before I had my shoulder surgery, and then you know I used to do Hindu squats. All the boys yeah. do Hindu squats on the road in the room. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done this. Get a deck of cards and just take take those 52 cards, just turn them over, yeah. whatever it is, card do that work. number. Deck of cards work. Yeah, yeah. And you could do you know uh, Hindu squats or air squats, whatever you call them, uh, push ups, sit ups. You you can match it all, so you can do a trifecta. Absolutely, almost your own wad. But anyway, uh, it so, is what they call the deck of cards one. Yeah. 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 So man, I was in there after about 150 of them. My damn outer thighs were just burning, and I was like, you know what? You got to be cool, calm, and collected today, and have your composure when you step out of that Ram Charger in front of these new contestants, <laughs> because we had a new group of people roll in, and the last thing I need to do is tumble out of that thing like a piece of trash, <laughs> selling my legs. So I pussed out at a buck fifty, jump on my bike, rode another two miles, and I timed myself. I found out that my cardio is severely lacking, <laughs> and but no, now I have a benchmark time. That's it's it. like the skull buster. So now I beat my benchmark time to work on my improvement. Let's go back to the original question I asked. How do you go about creating your workouts? Because my my thing is I get so lost in all of the minutia or the there's so many exercises. The way I do it. Monday chest, Tuesday back, right. Wednesday shoulders. Okay, you know, try, and I think, arms. I think I said that to you once on Twitter. I, I think I yeah. said to you, well, you're still doing that old school yeah. training. And all your Twitter fans, like, I got I got more hate mail than I've ever yeah. had in my life because of that. But well, it's, and, and you have so many great workouts on your website. How do you come up with this shit to know that, okay, uh, are you thinking like I'm doing? Because you're doing like one strength movement or skill movement. As you would, I'll just yeah. let you talk. How do you yeah, do I mean, I, I structure my workouts. Again, when we're on the road, it's a little bit different because – I, for me, it's just get it in. You know, today when I came when I came back here, I, I just have a kettlebell at the house here. I did I did kettlebell I did kettlebell raises. I did uh, uh, kettlebell squats, and I did Turkish get ups. So I did five rounds of ten and a two. I, do, I only do two kettle or two Turkish get ups, but that was enough, right? I met that commitment, that discipline to get my workout in. I don't care if you do one push up. If if your day is, you said you're going to work out today, just do one. You know what? Meet that goal, meet that commitment, and move on. You don't don't even fret about. It. Don't stress out that you didn't do a crazy workout. You did. You met your goal. You did a workout. Move on and be successful with your day. And that that's really key to me is is honoring whatever those commitments you make with yourself. That that's different. But for making up my workouts, I think when I first started way back when, I think I think I really first got into CrossFit 2005 2006 is when I kind of found it. Um, I, I went to the website. I did the website religiously. You know, there it's a it's an unbelievable resource. Um, not only do they post, post at CrossFit.com a website of the day, which or a workout of the day, which is for there for anybody. They also um, back in the day they used to have a video that would accompany it. Um, now on the website, I don't think they always have a video anymore, but there's usually a link to an archived workout which would have a video. So if you didn't know the movement, if you didn't know what a you know GHD sit up is, or if you didn't know what a a butterfly pull up or you know any of these uh, handstand push up if you didn't know the, the way these things work on that website you can find out everything works they, there's videos showing how to do the specific workouts there's videos showing how to do the specific movements it's a wealth of resource for somebody new it takes a while to get into it you got to dig um but if you just want to do something you can just show up there every day and do their workout you can figure out how to scale it i think it's uh beyond the whiteboard is a is a website beyond the whiteboard.com which um, actually has the scaled versions. They call them big dogs, uh, puppies, and uh, I forget the other ones, but it actually shows you scaled versions of that particular workout, uh, which is, again, another great resource. So for me, originally, it was just, I did whatever they said. I just, you know, here's the workout, I'll, I'll do it. As I started to, you know, people a lot of times use the, don't get me wrong, I love CrossFit, I love what they did, um, but there's, there's a good and bad to CrossFit, in my opinion. There's a, there's a good, which is real quality training, which is helping people get involved in the sport in the right way. And then there's a bad, which I believe is, is pushing people too hard too quick with real highly repetitive movements when you really don't know the history. You know, I got a lot of bumps and bruises in my body. You got a lot of bumps and bruises in your body. We're not going to start banging out or we shouldn't start banging out workouts that have, you know, 60, 70, 80, 90 pull-ups in it because our shoulders are going to die. That's where there's the bad in CrossFit. I think there's there's a lot of there's some CrossFit practitioners or where they don't really do that history on you, um, and in the early day that day I think that was really prevalent. 
Now I believe there's so much knowledge about this type of fitness. To me, when I structure my workouts now, it's all about keeping things, uh, keeping the variety. You know, if I did something with box jumps one day, shoulder press that day, and say a, uh, a deadlift, yeah, I want to switch it up in the next day. I'm not going to do deads, box jumps, or shoulders. Maybe I'm going to do a more um, high rep, uh, you know, I'll do double unders, I'll do wall balls, I'll do... Um, I'll do I'll do uh, half ball push ups and things like that. I, I mix it up so that I'm always create. The thing I like about CrossFit is its constant variety. Where we you know back in the day it was chest and by back and try shoulders and legs. We did it all the time Monday Wednesday Friday. Um, hundreds of hours in the gym doing that. What I like about CrossFit and that methodology that constantly varied um, is you can you can do a workout in five minutes and you're you're shattered. You can do a work. I don't really work out more than 30 minutes. Maybe, maybe on a rare day, if it's something like Murph or something like the Filthy 50 or something really long, maybe I'm doing something nonstop for 40 minutes. Very rare. Or if it's a 5K run or something like that. But for the most part, they average between, I'm going to say, 7 and 22 minutes. That's my, I go in, I do a skill. So if I suck at, at uh, my clean and jerk. I'm going to do skill movements for 15 minutes, or I'm going to warm up for 15 minutes. I'm going to do skill for 10 minutes, and then I'm going to do whatever what I, I choose to do that day. You know what I enjoyed about the workout today was, man, right now trying to recover from the shoulder surgery can't really explode into a weight. So I had to be careful even with the, the wad that I did just to make sure I got my workout in. But when my shoulder gets full speed, probably another four months, and I'm able to return to full strength on that side of my body, Man, I mean, I've been pushing heavy weights for so long. It's like I'm not really going to get any stronger at this point. I'm not really looking to get any bigger at this point. But what I liked about today's workout was it was variety. I got gassed, so I know it did something for me. That's it. I got I got my pump on. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would have had it with the, with the push ups. End up using the curls, and you know the uh, the squ- the air squats were you know they crushed me. You know when I was. It, n- now, That's what athletes it, want, it, dude. But it, but it, it opened my eyes to the possibilities because, man, I'm just, I, you know, I love the CrossFit games. They're highly competitive. I like to watch them. You know, we get a lot of CrossFitters out here. We get a lot of obstacle course racers, whatever your discipline is. But I was like, eh, you know, I don't need all the. Uh, the, the high rep stuff at such rapid speed, like Olympic lifting with my body, right arm don't straighten out, and all the surgeries, the, the, the kipping pull-ups, I'm never going to do any of those. But if you just take the model yeah. and use strict form, and then I'm competing, you know, it, you could say, you know, if I just set up, let's just say, you know, I did a, oh, just say I did a Murph. For yeah. everybody knows the, the, the workout, for everybody that knows the workout we just talked about, Murph, let's just say I do that. Now I got a time to compete against, That's it. and so there, you know, you, you know, because bodybuilding or weightlifting is progressive overload. I've overloaded enough. I can't load anymore. You know, at, at my age, with where I'm trying to, and, and so what much, I'm trying to be. We got so much history in the bones. Your bones aren't going to put up with it for much longer. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to getting back full strength first, and I want to get my uh, atrophy back and, and all my major body parts on my right side. That will happen, but then I'll switch gears and start doing that. And, and that that's that was an eye opener for me today doing that workout, yeah. and it was enjoyable. And, and I think the thing that that I, I encourage you to do is is track it. Right, you got to write it down. Yeah, what you did it's written down. Yeah, you write down. And if you got, I, and I encourage you anybody to do this it's if you really want to start one one thing that that i just it jazzes me and i i think i shared with you steve one of the things in the military was i i when we used to do hill runs or or long marches and this is where i first my, our, my motto for our family like if you if anybody asks my sons they say what's what are you bishops like and both my boys and my wife would say us bishops like hills um i eat hills i eat them for breakfast and i eat everybody's energy on a hill that I can, because I used to just, when racing or in the military, you know, people would start crapping out when that hill got hard. And, you know, we'd do a circle back and pick them up. And I'd know that last time I'm circling back, I'm like, I'm eating every bit of energy you have because I love hills and I'm going to suck it up. When you're in a workout and you know that, whatever, let's just say four months ago, you did this workout and you had a time and that time was whatever. It was five minutes. Um, or let's say 17 minutes and you finish that workout it's four months later you've knocked a minute and a half off your time 
something exciting just happened. You know, what was it? What, would, what did you unlock in yourself that allowed you to get that much better over four months? Even better, I go look back now on workouts that I was doing in 2009, 2010, and I was 40 years old then. I'm 47 now, and I'm beating sometimes that I did when I was 40 years old. It doesn't happen a lot anymore, but I'll tell you what, I'm jazzed, and that competitor in me, you know, I'm not competing against anybody else. I'm competing against myself. That's the point I wanted to make. You're competing with yourself, against yourself, for yourself. It is. You're in it for you. I don't give a rat's ass. It's nice to see the PRs on the wall when you've sure. got gems like that or wad times because those are benchmark times. And it's encouraging for people. And it's, Yeah, and it's something to shoot for if yeah. you're trying to compete against other people. But so my listeners always ask me, hey, Steve, talk to me about working out. So that's part of what – with the genesis for this conversation and speaking with Alan after we caught up with a little bit of his background and all these badass athletes we got coming down here at the Broken Skull Ranch. Uh, now, you know, I, like I always have been, I'm in it for me. I don't want to put more weight on the bar, but I still want to stay fit and get fitter. And, and today, is, I got exposed. Yeah, I got yeah, exposed. Yeah. I was like, holy, <laughs> holy smoke. I remember I'm your face this morning. Was, was well, I called out and over. <laughs> we just laid uh, the rules down. We were about to go into challenge one, and uh, they went off to do interviews. And I told Alan, I said, man, I got humble today. <laughs> and I laid out that workout I just gave you guys a while ago. I said, man, uh, 32 minutes. I said, son of a bitch. And I said, I felt smoked. It was a different feeling than they normally get coming out of a gym. Yeah. So anyway, I, I love training. But, but so. I, And I say that for your listeners out there. You know, anyone that's, whether you're, you're an elite athlete, you're, you know, everyone's got their training plans that they do. But if you can turn your fitness into that way that you're uncovering who you are and you're unlocking that potential within, you know, it's, it's a jazzy thing. Like you get fired up. You, you want to compete against yourself and you want to look at, you start making connections in what you're doing in your everyday life. And, and fitness has always been a big thing for me. And I think that's why you and I connect on a lot of levels, Steve. Fitness is a way of getting somewhere for me. It's a way of, of, of keeping able to do those things you want to do in life. But it's also, I mean, I love competing. I love, and this is, this is, I don't have to compete against anybody else. I know at the end of the day, when I'm wiping the sweat off my, off my forehead, did I give everything I had? Not only do I see it in the, in the writing on my book, but I know it in my heart. Like I know if I gave it enough and if I didn't beat my time or I didn't do good form or I did a shitty rep, I can't tell you how many times I, wall balls are the worst thing in the world. Have you ever, have you ever done, you got to get a wall ball. I gotta, that's something we got to get you. I've been meaning to get one. Okay, got to yeah. get you a wall ball. Because I'll tell you what, that is my, that's a bit of my kryptonite. I don't know what it is, but when I get into like four or five rounds at the end of a wall ball, uh, for some reason I start getting shitty form. And it pains me when I don't hit that X on my wall because I know I got to do another one. But I'll tell you what, I haven't walked, I've never not hit every wall ball that I've ever done in a workout because for me, if I don't, if I cheat on it, it's not doing anybody any good. That's, that's just screwing me up. And I know that I cheated on that workout or I cheated on myself. I cheated on that little bit of fitness. And, and that's the discipline that I really believe you can get when you, when you start really tracking what's right for you. Okay, I need to give a quick word of thanks to all the sponsors of the Steve Austin Show and to you guys for supporting all the sponsors. And that, of course, includes the one that could win you some serious instant cash, DraftKings.com. It's one-week fantasy football, so that means no season-long commitments. You ain't stuck with the same players. You can draft a new lineup every time you play. You like how Denver Broncos quarterback Trevor Siemens looked his first couple of games? Or maybe you think Drew Brees is going to rack up some serious passing and touchdown points for the Saints this coming weekend against Eli Manning and the Giants. Well, you can get either if you play at DraftKings.com. And if you use my promo code UNLEASH, you can play for free. In fact, DraftKings is hosting another free fantasy contest this weekend. $100,000 in total prizes are up for grabs. No deposit required. It's true. No deposit required. So you can really put your fantasy knowledge to the test for free to win your share of 100 grand this weekend. DraftKings is the destination for one-week fantasy football. So get to DraftKings.com now and use the promo code UNLEASHED and play for free in this weekend's $100,000 fantasy contest. This contest is free, no deposit required, so there's really no reason not to give DraftKings a shot. Again, use my promo code UNLEASHED to play for free for your share of $100,000 this weekend only at DraftKings.com. That's DraftKings.com. Eligibility restrictions may apply. See website for details. In one of your uh, um, blogs you wrote about having fun in the gym again. 
you know, everybody goes in all serious or it's about money, this, that, or whatever. Yeah. And you're as entrepreneurial as anybody else, but you're just talk about the pure aspect of working out. I mean, your workout ought to be a good time. Your workout, your workout ought to be a release for you. And I don't know, I'm just passionate about it. I don't know, sometimes I bitch about it, but I don't know what I'd do if I couldn't work out. If someone right. said, you can't work out anymore. I feel like shit. Yeah, what's it like when you're injured, right? Oh it's, yeah, well, this is a this is a killer. This it's is horrible. A ki- yeah, I, I'm sitting there you- just watching. But going back to tracking everything to make my point, if you write something down, and you're in it for yourself, and you can see the improvements you're making, you're like son of a bitch. They, Fuck, I'm coming along here. That's it. And so, if you're a truck driver going down the road, if you're a mechanic or whatever, you got high cholesterol. Anybody that that's not really uh, that listen to my uh, show. If you're not an athlete per se, but everybody always saying, hey, Steve, they send me emails all the time. I want to get in better shape. I want to get in better shape. Hey, man, you know, if you're on the road, you know, walk a mile from your truck, walk back. Or start at a half mile, walk back and time yourself. It starts somewhere. That's it. But if you write it down like you did for six years, you can see what the fuck works and what doesn't. And you, again, man, I'm competing with myself. When I can see that I'm beating times, you know, now Absolutely. that when I set for myself, I know I'm making an improvement. That's it. And I, and I think, you know, the tracking it is really important. I, I think that, and I also, this is something that I think we talked about a little bit. I think people set themselves up to fail too quickly. How so? Um, a lot of people, you know, let's use something that's really up and, you know, it's kind of, it'll be coming up soon, but the New Year's resolutions, right? Everybody makes New Year's resolutions. Some do, some don't, but a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. And I think it's 8% of, I think the stat is like 8% of New Year's resolutions make it past the first month or people that are doing resolutions make it past the first month. And that bothers me. Like it really, for years, it would, it would, it would irk me. And, and I think that's because people set themselves up for too big, of, too, too big of a failure they set these goals for themselves. You just talked about the truck driver to just walk a mile. You know, a lot of people would think, well, I'm just going to walk a mile. Now that's not enough. That's not a big enough goal. I got to lose 40 pounds. I got to be able to, you know, I got to be able to keep up with my, my son now who's working out in the gym. It's all bullshit. It's all this, this noise that society wants to sell you something with. At the end of the day, if you want to make a commitment to being better or being fit, I, I think everybody's an athlete. There's, I don't think we're, I don't, you know, there's elite athletes and there's people that get paid to be athletes and there's people that are Olympians. Good for them. I, I applaud everything they do and, and, and I admire what they do. But I do believe everybody's an athlete or at least has the potential to call themselves an athlete. Yeah, and, and I bet and with respect to, hey, just because you have a job that you're not out, you know, being an athlete, yeah. that doesn't mean you cannot be athletic. Absolutely. So and, 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 I, and I really think that, that, again, that's something that, you know, we term these athletes. Everyone's an athlete. You just got to set what kind of athlete you want to be. So what do people got to do to keep themselves from setting themselves up, up for failure? I, I think it's, it, I call it the Sam principle. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, like Sam I am. That's where it came from for me. Um, I just think they, it needs to be three things. It's got to be S is for simple. You've got to make sure that you make it as simple as you possibly can. It doesn't mean you can't get more complex in the, in the future because your simple in the future is going to be simple then. But for people that, let's just, again, let's take fitness. If you expect to go into a gym and start competing with those numbers that are on a wall or the video that you see somebody doing, you're already in the wrong mindset. You got to go in there and think, how can I get this as simple as possible? If it, if it means I say I'm committed to working out for the next 30 days, don't, don't say the next year, say the next 30 days. And you're going to do an exercise each day in those 30 days. Just do one exercise. If you're flat on your back with a fever of 104 because you've been looking after your kids and taking them to soccer and you've come home and you got a cold and you're too tired to work out, just do one exercise. Do one mindful crunch and know that you've made your commitment that day. You've kept maybe your day 23 in this 30 days. You're sicker than a dog, but you know what? Maybe you're not going to do a, your five-minute walk that you've been doing around the block. You're just going to do one crunch or one push-up or one deep knee bend. But you've honored your commitment by doing that. That's keeping it simple. The next one is actionable. you got to set an action to it. you got to say, you know, I'm going to do this at this time of night. I'm going to do it in this way. I'm going to take an action that forces me to do something. So you got to make sure it's actionable. And then the last part of Sam is measurable. You got to measure it. You got to write it down. You got to know, okay, if I, if I said I'm, I've walked a mile today, you got to walk that mile the next day. If you say you're going to do a strict push-up, it's got to be a strict push-up. Can't, you know, if you're going to be just, if you can just do knees, 
just do knees, but make sure you do the same measurement because then you know what you're going to improve on in the future. So simple, actionable, measurement or measurable. That's the sound principle. I just, I, I, anytime I work with someone around goals or commitments, that's what I go by. I go, let's take that. If your goal is to lose weight, let's boil that down as small as we possibly can. And let's figure out how we can do the most simple thing. You drink six cans of Coke a day. Let's just drink five. Super simple. And anybody can get rid of one can of Coke in a day. But maybe two months from now, you can easily go from five down to four. You can go four down to three. You can go three down to two. You can go two down to one. Pretty soon you're not taking in that sugar. You're going to notice an improvement in your life. You're going to notice an improvement in your fitness. And this year here at the Broken Skull Challenge, there's been a lot of athletes that have come out that just do body weight training only. So it's not like you got to join a gym to get in shape. People are like, hey, i got to join a gym. No, you don't have to join a gym. Man, with... with I was watching a, a YouTube video the other day. Guy was jumping rope without a rope. He was just going through the motions and jumping. So he didn't even have a rope. So you yeah. got push-ups, you got sit-ups, you got planks. If you got to fi- find a, a low bar to do, you know, uh, some just back rows. Back rows. Dips. I mean, jumping jacks. I did jumping jacks the other day for a warm-up. No, I was, doing them, I was doing them between sets. I was working chest. Started doing jumping jacks just to keep my heart rate up. All those exercises you see people doing, basic training. I mean, you can look at hey, any exercise. Calisthenics book. have been around for a long since the, yeah. since the so ancient you, ancient uh, ancient Greece. They've been doing that to keep people. And don't get a, a, a push up. A, yeah, a push up, uh, an air squat. Uh, I mean, the, the basics. A, they don't get any more simple than they are. And and sometimes it's just I, I showed you the other day when you're here. I said this is what I've been doing every morning this year. All I'm doing every morning. You know, in addition to my workouts, but what's made one of the biggest improvements in my life this year is something I've been doing every day as one of my commitments. I do movement every morning. Some people do yoga. Some people call it yoga. For me, it's just I move. I move my body, whether it's a foam roller, whether it's you know a downward dog, whether it's a warrior's pose or whatever. I just move my body. I do I do I do these stupid arm swings because I know I got to move my shoulder. I get my shoulders warmed up. I move every morning for between five and 15 minutes um, breathe and move and I'll tell you what that's enough that's if somebody if that's all you can do do it do one bit of movement in the morning get out of bed move with intention it's gonna you're gonna build on that build on that here's a question because one of the things that I was looking at in one of the wads or it was an exercise video I can't remember but someone oh it was a video I was watching someone was doing old school sit-ups in the background while someone was doing a, a wad for time my question is, with all the advances and the abdominal structure and the physiology of getting abs, what the fuck happened to the sit-up? The <laughs> sit-up got treated like a red-headed stepchild just left for dead. Yeah. Back when I was in school, you had to do sit-ups, and yeah. you, you would get in a club if you did X amount of sit-ups. That's I it. did 300-something sit-ups in like, it was like a minute or something, whatever, a couple of minutes, whatever. It's not a world record. I'm not going to the Olympics. But my point is... Alan, what the People fuck forgot happened to the setup? Set up? You don't get no up. love. If someone wants to do a setup and say, "No, no, dude, you're using the terrace this or or your some adductor in your thigh," what the fuck is wrong with the setup? There's nothing wrong with it. You know what? And and again, I think there's other there's a lot of ways to train your midsection. The number one is stop putting the Twinkie in your mouth. I think, <laughs> I think, if you want to see your abs, work on your diet. Don't yeah. worry about your sit ups. No, but it's uh, strengthening your core. Yeah, it's strengthening your core. And and I think again, I, I don't have anything wrong with the sit up. I think for me, when I think about core stuff now, it's it's stuff like it's stuff like deadlifts. It's stuff like if you can do an overhead squat. It's stuff like hanging off a bar and just doing knee raises. Um, it's working with uh, it's working with a ball and doing twisting motions. Um, even even just stretching, just doing just making sure you do mobility of the midsection. A lot of people forget that they got to warm up that area. But again, I don't have anything wrong with sit up half ball sit ups. Um, you can say a half ball. What's a half ball? You know those they call oh, it like Bosu, a Bosu ball. Bosu yeah, ball. That's, that's my fa- my favorite sit up. My favorite thing. Because a lot of times you can't find a GHD sit-up machine or, you know, you don't have a bar to hang off of. But you can grab a pillow. You can grab a, uh, you know, but if you're in the gym and you got a half ball, uh, I love taking, for me, I use a 20-pound medicine ball. And I kind of put my lower back on the ball, my feet out in front of me, and I'll pick up that ball, I'll reach back, fully extend that 20-pound ball over my head, bring it back up, and then crunch up. 
That so thing just your ass is on top of the ball. Half my my butt's just off the ground. Okay. And the lower my small on my back is on the rounded portion of the ball, and then I stretch out to full extension with the twenty pound yeah, yeah. medicine ball, and then curl it back in. I, I it's a great for me. It's a great scale on a GHD because um, uh, you can't find them everywhere, but it it works everything. It gives you it just I love it. I love it as an ab exercise, and I love toe or hanging knee raises. Those those to me are the other than the core exercises, doing plank and stuff like that. Let's shift gears. Uh, did you watch the uh, UFC fight recently? The last card here last yeah, weekend? Two yeah, two or three. Yeah, the uh, and Overeem? Yes. Yes. Uh, but we were talking today Fabricio. about the Fabricio. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was that front kick to the head? Fabricio Verdum versus Travis Brown. Man. Have you ever seen a front kick to the face in a heavyweight fight? Ever. Well, first of all, you don't even hardly see that to begin with. Then at the start of a fight, just got to charge across the ring and just fly in the air, and I he mean, was up there. I've seen Anthony Pettis do flying knees off the start of a thing, but I've never seen a guy that big do that. That was, I think everyone was shocked. And the cameras, oh, they damn near missed it. They, did, they had yeah. to go to replay to really show it because nobody expected it. And Travis Brandt, and, it, and it, it rattled him. I mean, it stunned him. And he, he regained his composure and you know until the, you know, the broken was, finger or whatever happened on a downward blow. Yeah, that was weird. That whole fight was weird. Well, see, that was weird. Because we talked UFC. Like, I've, I've watched every single UFC or been around that since day one. I remember watching it in, like, the Roadhouse Pub in 1992, watching the first ever fight, and I've been a fan ever since. Like, I, I just, I'm a huge UFC fan. So what were your thoughts when he kind of, pulled, uh, when Travis got his finger? I mean, it was it was a weird strike. Uh, the way it happened, basically like a hammer fest, right? Fabrizio should have been punching him in the face. Like, there's no reason to stop the fight then. That shouldn't have been stopped. But the referee stepped in and he kind of made a, the timeout sign, but it was kind of shielded from Fabricio's view. It looked, and from my vantage point, and I don't know nothing, nothing about the rules, but then Fabricio came and tagged him, yeah. and the referee goes, hey, man, I'm doing a timeout. And Fabricio's like, hey, there ain't no timeouts, which is right. Which is absolutely, and again, they brought Mark Ratner in to, to talk about that. During like I think Joe was like Mark, come on in, let's talk about that. And, and yeah, they shouldn't have stopped the fight. But what do you do? Like again, but the way we, he was holding his hand, I thought there was a malfunction with his glove. That's weapon. what I thought too. I thought it was a glove, and maybe the ref thought that, and that's why they stopped. So again, we we talk about this. You got to be in the room to make a decision. You can't you can't be an armchair quarterback with stuff you don't know about. But just in talking about the fight, you know, Fabricio yeah. was looking to win the fight so he could get an untitled yeah. shot. But he thought a win would put him in contention. He didn't, he didn't look great to me in that fight. He looked angry, but he, there was something weird going on in that fight, and then especially in the aftermath. But then, then towards the end, you know, he knew Travis had that hurt uh, mitt. What was it? His, uh, it was Left. his right? Because he was throwing yeah, was either right. one. Yeah. But he wasn't using that hand, basically. And he really had to utilize his kicks throughout the entire fight. He brought some in the, what, the third round, Yeah. but it was too late. But Fabricio just kind of cruised because he knew he had to fight. And that's all he wanted was the W. And he, he was trying to finish him at one point in the fight, and Travis got out of it. I don't know, just uh, it's a win's a win. The dude's a bad stick of wood. Ain't no doubt about it. And if he's just looking for the title shot, it is what it is. But I, I didn't. Just, something something was, was weird. And then to, to do that front kick to, to Tavarian at the trainer at the end, like what's going on with that whole camp? It was a weird thing. I, I don't – something must have been going on because he would have been fine. Like I don't know the – I mean, something must have happened that that was justified that he that he threw that kick because he hasn't been suspended. There's been well. No- here's the thing, because Joe Rogan covers everything, but they didn't talk about really the melee after that. So it was almost like maybe someone buzzed him in the ears. Hey, man, kayfabe the the incident, because man, they don't miss anything. They don't. And, you know, Rogan is a student of the game, and he's you know he's outstanding as a you know the commentary color guy whatever you call him he's outstanding so so speaking to rogan what about the overeem fight what did you think about the interview at the end when overeem's like i thought he tapped and then they do the two slow motion re- like did you think he got thrown under the bus a little bit there overeem or no i thought uh i don't know if you were paying attention but i kept the pay-per-view on and then it showed uh, Goldberg and Rogan talking at the end of the fight. It looked like the arena had cleared out. And he was saying, Joe said, man, you know, I don't even know why I interviewed that guy in that state of mind because Joe knows. You yeah. know, he's been there. Yeah, you he get goes, your bell rung. When, you, when you get your bell rung, you don't really know what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, in theory or, or maybe in practicality, he might, he might have thought he felt a tapping, but once he watched the video and he's still not home yet, yeah. 
you know, now he's sitting there, he's kind of bamboozled. So, it's like a, Rogan said, I think he was out of sorts when he said it. Maybe he felt something, but you watch the replay from both the angles. There was no tap. There was no tap. And and I think I think Joe, I think he's come out too, and he said he said I don't want to do interviews with people that have been concussed anymore, which is a smart move by Joe because I don't think it looked good on anyone. No, um, not the UFC, not the not not uh, Overeem for sure. Because yeah, you and just it's lost a bad, it's just a bad position to put somebody it is. in. Yeah, you and know, you've seen some, and you've seen some horrible interviews by people who have been knocked out. They don't want to be there. They just lost. They don't want to be, whether it's contractual. I don't know what the guys have contractually if they're I know, but yeah, but they, they got to take the, the, you know, the responsibility of the fact that when someone gets their bell wrong, they're not functioning right. And That's so, it. hey, leave them alone. Just let them do their thing. They just, dude, you saw how many times they tried to stand him up on that, put him on that stool. He, yeah, he fell off. He was gone. Time. How about uh, the news today, the little rumor about John Jones fighting uh, for heavyweight? Come on, man! Are you the kidding rumor me? was there was I saw the rumor mill starting that that Jones would uh, take hold a heavyweight on, play. Hold on, before we go to Jones, man, that guy, <laughs> dude with a Nike contract in the MMA world, I made a lot of mistakes when I was growing up. But someone, you know, when you're and he's going to make mistakes, and he has, but you got to have somebody around. Uh, yeah. Like a custom motto for Mike Tyson, just anybody that can – like me, when I was young and wrestling, but say, hey, Steve, smarten up, dude. You're going to blow you everything. Future, you got a future here. So, he, I, I, you know, he just – he got tested hot, you know. So what's what's going to go on with that sanction? What's, what was the penalty? I never heard the back end of that. I, they haven't said. Like it was a – So that's what I'm saying. I mean, they, so I don't if there's think a rumor – I still gonna, don't think they've come out and said that it was a, uh, a Cialis or whatever, whatever it was he was taking. I don't think they've actually officially come out and made any ruling or anything. I just want to know about that ruling before yeah. I address the fact that he may, might move up to heavyweight. But speaking of heavyweights, let's talk about that main event. Steve Amiochik versus Alistair Overeem. When Overeem caught him with a good shot, I mean, just a, it looked like a stiff jab. And, you know, Alistair hits like a truck, and he kicks like a Mack truck as well. Put him down, and he got him – tried for a guillotine. Yeah. And then, boy, Stipe, you got to give that guy a ton of credit because – He's a brawler, man. Oh, man, that dude's bad. And hometown in Cleveland? Yeah, and that crowd was so behind him, and they should be. He's, Absolutely. he's a great champion. He's the toughest nails, and he's paid his dues. He's to, paid, that's yeah. what I love about him. He's paid his dues. He's one of those guys, you know, there's not a lot of flash to him. But here's the he's thing. He's a working man, and – Here's the thing. Had that been Fabricio, who had tapped him, knocked him down, and got him in that guillotine – Mister, it might be a whole different ball game, but it was Alistair Overeem. Yeah. He didn't know. I mean, obviously, the dude's way more bad and accomplished with uh, combat than I am. For sure. But he's not a dude. He's not known as a ground guy. Anymore. I know, but at this stage of the game, you a basic like a guillotine. Yeah, and early, pretty early in the fight too. Yeah, right? that was like what two two minutes in something like that. Yeah, whatever it was. Yeah. But you know, had he had a ground game. You know, you could be looking at a different champion right now. You could. And be, but you're not, you know, he, Stipe got out of it. He didn't tap. And I'll tell you what, man. Holy smokes. That pounding he ground and pounded. I mean, you've seen some guys do it. I mean, Chuck Liddell was a great – when Chuck got somebody in that kind of position, the thing I liked about, about Chuck and, and what Miocic did at that fight, I mean, he stood up. He got a couple down. He stood up. He got, he got one big bomb that missed, and then his second was on – and then he – you look at guys that can finish fights, and he's a finisher. He's finished every single time he's had a chance, and he finished well. Man, when he postured fight. up and started raining those bombs down, I was like, holy smokes, can you hit anybody any harder than that? Yeah, I don't and, think you can. And alice has got a big head. <laughs> he's got a big jaw. He's tough, too. Well, hey, man, we've been talking for about an hour and ten minutes uh, on a website. Your website is the 365effect.com. And on Twitter, you're the 365 Effect. That's it. So tell me about the 365 Effect before we hang up the phone and call this interview a day. Because you offer to train people on there. Yeah. You know, help people there, find their better. There's kind of, better. There's two ways. Um, at the end of the day, the 365 Effect is basically a system that I've, that I've created um, where you honor four commitments over the course of a year. And what I help people do is, is kind of try to find out what those four commitments could be and then how to whittle them down to be as simple as possible so that you can set this pattern of, of discipline, of commitment, and moving in the steps you need to change your life. And it's amazing what you can accomplish in a year. A year is nothing when you, when you look at it back over the course of your life. Um, 
a year really isn't anything, but I've, I've, I've found and, and people have found that have, have taken the program, when you commit to something for 365 days, it, it, it will change your life. It, it can't help but change your life. You're going to get something from it. The other thing I offer on there, too, is I offer the Bish Box, which is, you know, it's just my kind of private playground where I share this fitness journey that I've been on. And, and um, you know, come the new year, we're going to launch a whole big new site just to do too many of these TV shows. I don't get a chance to spend the time there. But I'm committing, I'm committing to doing that for the new year. The other thing I do is I do this thing called I Challenge You. And bottom line with I Challenge You, and I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. What I do is I design a 30-day custom challenge. So I basically get you to fill out a 10-question questionnaire. You send that questionnaire back to me. And from that questionnaire, I design a 30-day challenge that is unique to you that I, I guarantee if it doesn't change your life or it doesn't give you a, a better way to, to make some kind of change you want in your life, um, you know, I give people their money back, but no one's ever had their money come back because, I mean, and it's... It's unique. Everybody's unique. And I, I think I've been doing challenges for, you know, 30 years. So I've got a, a wealth of experience that allows me to kind of go, wow, if I, you know, this person seems like they're really interested in changing this part of their life, I'll design a challenge for them that uh, they honor for 30 days. And it's simple, but you do it for 30 days, it's going to make a difference. Does 30 days uh, make a habit into a permanent Yeah, I mean, they always say 26, 26 days yeah. is, the, is, the, is the sort of thing that you have to do. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know necessarily. I think it's you got to make the commitment, and and I think you've got to learn how to make a commitment for yourself. Some people, it's night and day. You know, we talk about you. You said you know the other day you're going to stop doing a couple things because you you have a goal and you just switch that switch in your head, and you're committed to it. Some people don't have that same type of commitment. They got to ease into it or they got to figure out what's right. What I find with the 30 days is it really allows people to see that part of their world open up. You know, if, if you've never done it before, you've never been strict or been disciplined in that way, it gives you some insight into what your life could be like if you, you know, change things or set some goals or did this this specific type of formula. All right. We're going to wrap it up. I'll see you tomorrow at work. We'll be out there. Good sun, rain, sun, or shine. <laughs> yeah, I hope it's hotter than shit. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> We're out. Good talking to you. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. But before I give you something to watch, let me tell you about that workout I was talking about. The original workout is called Murph. It's named after Navy Lieutenant Michael Murphy, who was killed in Afghanistan June 28, 2005. And uh, this workout was one of Mike's favorites, and he named it Body Armor. And from here on, it will be referred to as Murph, in honor of the focused warrior and great American who wanted nothing more in life than to serve this great country and the beautiful people who make it what it is. This is directly from CrossFit.com. Go to CrossFit.com if you want to read more about Murph or learn anything. They've got some great information, great tips. That came, that quote came directly from the CrossFit.com website, so you know why they call it Murph. And for time... It is a one-mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and a one-mile run. I modified that workout. I can't do all this stuff because of my shoulder, so I changed it to suit my needs. Now, the workout I did is in no way as tough as Murph, but it was a starting point for me while I get my cardio on and heal up from my shoulder. I made mine a two-mile assault air bike ride. Then I did 100 hammer curls with 30-pound dumbbells. Then I did 200 crunches. Then I made 150 air squats. I couldn't make it to 300. I didn't have the time, and I needed to walk in front of the contestants. And then I did a two-mile bike ride on the assault air bike. And after I did it the first time, my time was 32.01. After I did it the second time, my time was 27 minutes and 16 seconds. So that's my new best time. The first one was kind of just rolling out of bed and getting in it. My second time is 27.16. This in no way compares to the original Murph wad. So, again, I just want to let you guys know that I beat my time. I'm working on my fitness. If you need any kind of tips, I'm not selling CrossFit, but I'm just saying I use their website, so I want to give them a shout-out. Anyway, give you guys something to watch. I'm talking to Nita Strauss, the guitarist, lead guitarist for Alice Cooper on Saturday. That will air on the Tuesday podcast. So if you want something to watch, just go to YouTube and type in Nita Strauss. She's a badass guitarist, a super shredder. She is very well-spoken, very articulate, very eloquent, highly intelligent. 
this young lady started paying her dues around 15. She hit the road, and that's all I'm going to give you of her story because we're going to get her story on a Tuesday podcast. But anyway, hey, man, I got some badass new T-shirts coming out of this Broken Skull Challenge. They're all the new Broken Skull Ranch shirts. They're at BrokenSkullRanch.com. Broken Skull IPA from El Segundo Brewing Company in California is at Whole Foods Total Wines. And if you don't live in California, go to BrokenSkullRanch.com. Click on the link, and it'll take you to a place that will deliver to your state if your state allows it. Don't forget the Broken Skull Knife from Cold Steel and Steve Austin. You can find that. A link to that at BrokenSkullRanch.com. The easiest place to find that and the cheapest place to find that is Amazon and use one of my links. I appreciate you guys supporting the sponsor of the Steve Austin Podcast. They're the ones who let me do this for you free twice a week. So big thanks to DDPYoga.com. Go to DDPYoga.com slash Austin to get 20% off the DDP Yoga program and three months of full access to the DDP Yoga Now app. Big thanks to DraftKings. Go to DraftKings.com and use the promo code UNLEASHED to play for free in this weekend's $100,000 contest. Big thanks to BetDSI.com. Use my promo code AUSTIN25 to get $25 free to try the service. Big thanks to Dollar Shave Club. Get a month free when you sign up at DollarShaveClub.com slash UNLEASHED. And, of course, thanks to Amazon, who have been supporting this podcast from day one. Just use my Amazon links whenever you're doing any online shopping, and Amazon will kick back a couple of bucks to the podcast. It doesn't cost you anything extra. There ain't no hidden fees or charges. You can buy whatever you plan on buying and help out the podcast in the process. You can find my Amazon links by going to podcastone.com, clicking on the Killer Deals button in the top right corner of the page, and then hit the Steve Austin Show button. I have Amazon links for USA, UK, and Canada. Just go to podcastone.com, click the Killer Deals button in the top right corner, then click on the Steve Austin Show. All of my great sponsors are there. All my Amazon links are there, too. Don't buy nothing special. Don't buy nothing you don't need. There ain't no extra charges, no hidden fees, but whatever you do buy, Amazon will kick back a small percentage to the show to help cover production costs. Bookmark it so you can find it easier. Hey, keep listening. The 60-second AP News headlines are coming up next. Until then... My name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. When shopping for car insurance, consider this. GEICO has been saving people money on car insurance for over 75 years. So if you're serious about savings, it's simple. Go to GEICO.com. After 75 years, they know how to save you money. P Update. I'm Carlotta Bradley. Southeastern governors are dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew. Florida Governor Rick Scott. The brunt of our problem is is really right now in northeast Florida. I'm going to be here until people uh, get back. I want them back to work. I want them businesses. 